My name is Theo, and my wife Laura and I have been counting down to our silver anniversary for 25 years. We had our ups and downs, just like any other relationship, but our bond was always special. Alora had this ambition since we were young and broke, leafing through glossy travel magazines together in our tiny first apartment. She'd always halt at photographs of Fiji's beautiful sandy beaches, crystal blue water, and those little houses over the ocean. She'd have this distant look in her eyes, and I could tell it wasn't simply a holiday destination for her. It was a dream, and as our 25th anniversary approached, I thought, this is it. Now is the moment to make your desire come reality. I wanted to see the brightness in her eyes again. That was a genuine surprise. So I started plotting in secret. It took me months of saving on the side, studying the best resorts and selecting the ideal remote seaside villa. I even asked a local Fijian band to play our song when we arrived. It was going to be picture perfect. My heart raced every time I imagined the moment when I would reveal the surprise. Just picturing her face lighting up made all of the sneaking around, white lies about where the money was going and late-night plotting worthwhile. It was my way of showing her that even after 25 years, I would still go to great lengths for you. So, with everything ready, I hid the tickets in a scrapbook. I had created a life biography with images from our embarrassing first date to the present. The final page was intended to show a photo of Fiji with the caption for the following chapter. I found it cheesy, but in a good way. And as D-Day approached, I was vibrating with anticipation. However, as you can expect, things did not go as easily as I had intended. But let us not get ahead of ourselves. That part comes later. Thanks for the awards, kind strangers. I'll provide an update with part two soon. Hello again, Reddit. Wow, I didn't expect such a response to my last post. I am grateful for all of your support. Truly, it's helping more than I expected. Okay, take a deep breath. Here goes. Part 2. Work has always been my getaway. When things at home got stressful or I simply needed to clear my mind, diving into a project proved beneficial. I work in software development and my team is very close-knit. We've worked too many all-nighters and attempted too many impossible projects not to be. Bryn is smart and occasionally overly blunt. Lead designer. There's Jana, the team's caffeine-fueled developer, and a couple of others. Then there's me. It was a Thursday and I believe lunchtime passed without noticing. We were in the break room. I was discussing with Bryn and a few others about how Laura had been working late a lot lately and how much I missed our evening walks. Bryn, drinking his pricey latte, spoke casually about late nights. Isn't it weird? I looked up, perplexed. What do you mean? Bryn shrugged. Laura and Lucan. They certainly spend a lot of time together. It's more than just colleague time, if you get my drift. He smirked as if he was in on some inside joke I wasn't aware of. Now I knew Lucan. He was member of Laura's department. We'd met a couple times at corporate events. He seemed like a decent guy. Laura mentioned him now and again, usually work-related. They cooperated on projects, friends, right. But Bryn's comment lingered like a little bothersome mosquito buzz that you couldn't quite pinpoint. I attempted to brush it off. They're only buddies. Probably working on some big project... I responded, feigning a laugh. Bryn just raised his eyebrow. If you say so, gentlemen. I wished he was just being himself, trying to get a rise out of people. But as time passed, I became more aware of some things. Whispers echoed around the workplace, and Alora Laura grew distant. Her phone was usually facing down. Had I been so preoccupied with my plans that I missed something so important taking place right in front of my eyes? The seeds of doubt, as you correctly pointed out in the comments, were planted, and believe me, they grew rapidly till the following time. Reddit Part 3 is a doozy. To those who believe Bryn may have his own motivations, I never thought of it that way, but believe me, the narrative just gets more complicated from here. Hello again, Reddit. I've been reading through your comments on the last post, and it's both comforting and scary to know that some of you have been in similar situations. Let's look into where the genuine uneasiness began. Remember when life was simple? Remember when your main concern was whether you wanted pepperoni or cheese on your pizza? Yeah. Those days seemed far behind me. The house that once echoed with laughter and shared secrets has become dense with anxiety. It felt like trying to breathe underwater. Laura's phone seemed to be constantly vibrating. Late night messages and early morning pings, more than I had ever noticed. And every time she took a call, she angled the screen away from me or left the room. 
The once open book of our existence together was gradually being replaced by sealed diaries. One evening, I proposed that we try to reignite our old behaviors. How about we see that new movie you've been raving about? She appeared distracted, tapping away on her phone. Who is texting this late? I asked, attempting to sound nonchalant. Just work-related stuff. She whispered, her eyes never leaving the screen. I took a deep breath. Is this how she looked up? Eyes wide and slightly defensive. Her words conveyed more than they did. Why are you asking that? It's simply some project updates, she blurted out before shifting the conversation to the neighbor's cat. Late hours in the office became the norm. Lara, who used to rush home for our snug dinner and movie nights, began returning home long after I had fallen asleep. When she did get into bed, she'd turn aside, deep in contemplation, miles from where I was. Remember? Bryn's small hint? I felt foolish for not taking it seriously. Every fiber of my being shouted that something was wrong. But I tried to convince myself that it was just work stress. Perhaps the upcoming anniversary was causing her anxiety. Yeah, I understand. Denial is more than just a river in Egypt. I confided in my best friend Jackson. We had been broke since college. He was my wingman when I initially met Lara over a few beers. I laid everything out. He listened deeply in consideration before saying, Man, you need to talk to her. Straight up. No games. I knew he was correct. But was I prepared for the answers? Hey Sam, read it. I've been dreading this section, but the story isn't complete without it. So this is how my world went apart. It was Saturday. Except for the hum of the air conditioner, our normally bustling weekend home was peaceful. Laura was in the shower and I was relaxing on the couch, playing some much-needed video games to distract myself from, well, everything. As I reached for my controller, I noticed Alara's purse tumble from the counter, spilling its contents, which included a wallet, lipstick, miscellaneous receipts, and a folded piece of paper. Normally, I would never intrude her privacy, but something about that paper drew my attention. The handwriting was not hers. I picked it up and realized that it was addressed to her by Luke and Laura. It began. My pulse raced as I read, Every stolen moment with you makes me feel alive. We had covert meetings in the park. The excitement of hiding from the world. It's intoxicating to be around you. Everything else fades. How do you feel when we are together? I felt as if someone had punched the air from my lungs. Each word was like a dagger to my very core. I read and reread the letter, thinking that I had misinterpreted it or that it was a terrible joke. But it wasn't. The irrefutable truth was present in black and white. A storm of emotions assaulted me. Anger, sadness, disbelief. The room appeared to swirl. Was this actually happening? Were the past 25 years meaningless? I hear the water cease signifying the conclusion of Laura's performance. Her terror had set in. Should I confront her now? Should I wait? Is this the moment when our quarter century together comes crumbling down? I immediately returned the letter to the dispersed contents of her handbag, making it appear unaltered. I needed time to contemplate. I could scarcely look at her when she entered the room. Every smile, touch, and memory was now tinged with uncertainty, but I retained my poker face, not revealing my discoveries. That night, lying next to her, I felt more alone than ever. Sleep eluded me. The disturbing phrases from the letter echoed in my head. Each iteration generates a new wave of misery. I will leave this update here. Read it. It's difficult to relive, but you've been an excellent source of support. I promise. Part 5 will be released soon and you will not believe the confrontation. Edit. For those of you who think I should have approached her straight away, trust me, I wanted to. However, sometimes the weight of reality keeps you back. Hello, read it. First and foremost, I'd want to thank everyone for their nice remarks and suggestions on my prior articles. They have served as a beacon in a dark period. So here's how the confrontation unfolded. I was in a daze for days after discovering that letter. Every conversation with Laura felt like a fake as I dealt with the rage and hurt that was seething inside of me. I mentally replayed the events, but one evening as we sat across from each other at dinner, the weight of the quiet proved too great to take, with the letter clutched in my hand. I looked at Laura, took a big breath, and inquired, What is going on between you and Luke? Her eyes widened with shock. For a brief moment, I thought I saw shame flicker across her face, but she swiftly concealed it. What do you mean? She responded, 
pretending innocence. I put the letter on the table. This is Laura. What's this? Her face became pale as she glanced at the letter. Theo, it isn't as it seems, she whispered. Tears were gathering in her eyes. Then please. I spoke, my voice quivering with emotion. Let me know what it is. She remained silent for a time as she collected herself. We, we just got close, you know. We discussed stuff, thoughts, and feelings, but it was never. It was not supposed to be this way. I felt a searing pain from betrayal. Shared sentiments. How about our feelings? What about our memories? Did they mean nothing to you? Laura cried. I never intended to hurt you. This was a mistake. Her remarks, however, felt empty, especially in comparison to Lucan's honest emotions in the letter. She attempted to gaslight me further. We're just very close pals, Theo. You're overreacting. You're always so jealous. Close buddies. After what I'd witnessed and felt. A Laura. Do not disrespect my intelligence. Close pals do not send letters like this. She looked disappointed and avoided my gaze. I'm so sorry, Theo, she whispered. But was she regretful for the conduct or for getting caught? The border between reality and falsehood had become so blurred that I could no longer tell. That night, our house, which had previously been a haven of love and trust, felt like a prison of doubt and broken dreams. I will resume soon. Reddit putting this down is therapeutic in some ways, but it is also really painful. I need a break. Okay, read it. I am back. Buckle up. Because this section is... Okay, just read. The day following the confrontation with Alara, I felt lost. Part of me was yearning for an explanation, something more than Laura's half-hearted apologies. Was the second half of this twisted equation. I needed to know his side of the tale. After some searching, I discovered his contact information. We decided to meet in a cafe in downtown Boston, away from prying eyes. I recall the restaurant being alive with bustle, people speaking, coffee machines hissing, silverware clinking. However, in my world... Everything was silent, save for the pounding ache in my chest. Lucan seemed nervous when I went in. As we seated, he took a long breath. He started before you could say anything. I'd like to apologize. My face was a mask of rage. Go on, I responded curtly. He groaned and looked down at his hands. This, this began as a foolish game. Some pals and I, we had a sick challenge. He was hesitant to see who could come near to someone's wife, and if we could take them away... I just stared. My jaw dropped. Are you telling me that my life, my love, was merely a piece in your sick game? Luke nodded. Shame was clear in his eyes. Yes, but it escalated, Theo. It became more than simply a game. Feelings became involved. It became complicated. Rage welled up within me. So my 25 years with Laura were merely a joke to you, some competition. He flinched. I never intended for it to go this far. I should have stopped. But, as I already stated, feelings became involved. Feelings? I spit. How about my feelings? Laura's feelings? He looked down, defeated. I cannot defend what I did. I botched up. The enormity of his confession was too much to bear. My wife wasn't simply having an affair. It was a challenge for him. A game. Part of me wanted to lash out. To yell. To relieve all of my suffering. But another portion was simply numb. I got up, leaving Luke inside. In the cafe, grappling with his remorse or whatever he was feeling, the days following the cafe revelation were the darkest I've ever had to face. Everywhere I turned, treachery pressed down on me, but the anguish brought a burning determination. I had had enough of being the victim in this twisted game. It was time to change the script. I devised a strategy to give them a chilly dish of vengeance. I called Laura, my voice purposely tearful. How about a pre-anniversary dinner? A fresh start for both of us. I would like Lucas to be there as well. Let us clear the air. She sounded relieved as if she saw this as a sign that I was ready to move on from the betrayal. That sounds beautiful, Theo, she said hesitantly. On the night of the meal, I reserved the private dining room at Boston's most premium restaurant. I wanted the setting to scream special occasion. The irony was not lost on me. As the night neared, my tummy was full with tension and excitement. They both entered, looking uneasy. I smiled at them, attempting to keep my expression neutral. I thanked them for arriving and ushered them to their seats. They exchanged nervous glances but did not say anything. After we placed our order, 
I decided to arrange the stage. I raised my glass to new beginnings. I toasted. They raised their glasses hesitantly. As the night progressed, I regaled them with anecdotes from our past, carefully choosing the most intimate moments. Laura and I agreed that every anecdote was a reminder of the life they were attempting to break apart. Dessert marked the climax. I had put together a spectacular film clip, a walk down memory lane. I announced and pressed play. The screen displayed happy moments, our wedding holidays, and the birth of our children. Their faces became paler with each scenario. The video concluded with the text, 25 years. Was it all a game? Silence. Their faces were full with astonishment and guilt. Laura's eyes filled with tears. Theo, I... I raised my hand to stop her. I brought you both here not for reconciliation, but so you could properly understand the seriousness of what you'd done. This, I indicated on the screen, is what you attempted to destroy. Lucan was the first to break. I'm so sorry, Theo. He seemed truly sorry. I nodded coldly. Enjoy the remainder of your evening. With that, I withdrew, leaving them to wrestle with their conscience. Read it. The retaliation may not have been explosive, but just seeing their faces and knowing they endured a fraction of the sorrow I had was enough for me. There will be further updates. Hello, again. Read it. I left out a significant aspect in my previous piece, but I needed some time to collect my thoughts before disclosing this shocking revelation. So here goes. Before supper, when my rage was still fresh from the cafe meeting with Lucan, I had an idea. I texted him, pretending to be more empathetic and attempting to see things his way. He surprised me by responding, and we had a lengthy conversation that he was unaware of. I captured the entire discussion at the pre-anniversary meal shortly after the video montage concluded, and the room was filled with shame and remorse. I pulled out my phone. I announced, There's something else I'd like everyone to know. I played the recording. Lucan's voice filled the room as he described their twisted game, his competition with pals, and how it all began as a fun challenge, but evolved into something more serious. The searing confession, dripping with shame and guilt, resonated throughout the silent room. Everyone looked at Lucan. His confident demeanor was evaporated, replaced by pure shame. He seemed to want the dirt would swallow him completely. In contrast, Alora was shocked. It seems that she was oblivious of the game Lucan and his buddies had played. The expression she gave him was one of hurt and betrayal. She had been played just like me, Lucan. Why, she muttered, her voice trembling. Lucan for once was silent. The burden of the truth hung heavily in the room. I took a deep breath. I wanted you all to know the truth, to comprehend the significance of the game they played with our life. I said, gazing directly at Lucan. The rest of the evening was a haze. People were upset, murmuring amongst themselves. Some consoled Laura while others cast critical glances toward Lucan. The unity in their betrayal had crumbled and the tables had turned. I exited the restaurant with a sense of finality. The anguish was far from done. Unveiling the truth was a step towards healing. Okay, read it. Another update. This one is heavy. A few days after the dinner reveal, I found myself holding the two Fiji tickets. A journey meant to celebrate our love. A heartbreaking reminder of what was lost. My heart wrenched as I thought of the surprise I had prepared. The dreams were crushed. I called Alara and asked to meet. She hesitated, but then consented. We chose a little park near our home where we had taken our children numerous times when they were smaller, a place full with memories from simpler times. She was already there when I arrived, looking dejected. The vivacious, confident woman I fell in love with seems to have vanished without a word. I took out the tickets and held them in front of her, her eyes widened with awareness. Fiji, she whispered. I nodded, fighting back tears. This was meant to be a special surprise, a reminder of our affection. But things have changed. My voice cracked. It no longer conveys the same meaning as before. She looked at the tickets. Tears were flowing down her face. Theo, I... I raised my hand to stop her. I considered going alone. But then I thought you might want to go. Maybe Lucan would want to join you. The remarks came out colder than I wanted, but I was filled with genuine emotion. I gave her one of the tickets. She took it. Her hand trembled. We both recognized the significance of the symbolic gesture. I apologize, she muttered, but it felt hollow. Everything did. 
I took a deep breath and tried to maintain my composure. Perhaps this vacation will provide you clarity, Alora. Perhaps it will help you find what you're looking for. I turned away, leaving her standing there among the memories of our past. The vacation to Fiji, once a sign of love, has become a sort of parting gift. Hello again. Read it. It's Theodore. I'm penning this from a small cafe in Fiji, facing the most beautiful beach you could imagine. As the waves roll in, I can't help but think about everything that has transpired. Fiji. I had such different expectations for this vacation. Warm laughing, hands intertwined, and loving glances shared between Laura and me. But this is the reality. It's only me. The huge ocean and a heart attempting to put itself back together. The beauty here is unsurpassed. Every morning I watched the sunrise. The sky was painted pink and gold. However, there remains a hole, an emptiness that cannot be filled by even the most gorgeous scenery. Every sunset informs me that another day has passed. Another day with the wound still fresh. I've met a diverse range of people here. A couple is celebrating their honeymoon. A family on vacation. Also present is Mr. Patella, an elderly man who has spent his entire life in Fiji. He was the one who provided a wise bit of advice that struck a deep chord. Young man, sometimes the waves smash hard, but the ocean always returns to calm. At first I assumed he was talking about the sea, but as the days passed I realized it was about life, about love, about the ups and downs we all experience. Elora and Luke have never crossed paths with me here. While a part of me dreaded running into them, Lee, perhaps out of masochism, longed to. I wanted to know if they had found happiness in their betrayal, if it was worthwhile. But as the days went, the anguish began to subside, replaced with a realization. Our love story, as beautiful as it was, had reached its conclusion. Trust. Our relationship was completely shattered, and no travel, no amount of time could restore it to its original state. Tomorrow, I return home, but not to the same life. I've resolved to start over, away from the shadows of the past, but I haven't decided where. But wherever I go, I'll carry the lessons of Fiji with me. Please read it. This might be my final update on this part of my life. Thank you for supporting me through the highs and lows. The trip is far from over, but I know I am not alone. Edit for those who responded with good comments, tales, and guidance. Thank you. It conveys more than words can explain. When you hear about men who have been cheated on by their partners, you can't help but wonder how they feel. What did he do? I simply know he's going to end his marriage and find someone better. Most men deserve better. But there's only one problem. Can someone fully recover from being cheated? Will they ever be able to trust someone again? I recently realized that my wife of six years had been cheating on me for three years with a random guy she met at our wedding, and I'm not sure how I feel or what to do. I am torn between gently filing for divorce and being on the 9 p.m. news about something I might do. As I write this, I am at a wedding, sitting on the bed with a bag of clothes in front of me. I still can't understand the scenario or how I was so blinded by my passion for my war that I didn't realize sooner. I need to tell someone what occurred or I may lose my sanity. My name is Greg Okoro, and I am a dark-skinned 42-year-old 511 male married to Clara Aide a light-skinned 36-year-old five, three girl. Clara and I met in the shopping center. We were both at the checkout line when a man appeared out of nowhere and stepped in front of Clara, who was annoyed by his actions. Clara tapped on his back to catch his attention before requesting him to move to the end of the queue where there were people waiting for her. As I previously indicated, Clara is 5'3", and this guy stood at least six feet tall and glared down at her before angrily telling her to mind her own business and let him pay for his goods. Clara did not stop, but instead asked him to move to the back of the queue, which irritated him so much that he threw his grocery basket on the floor and turned to face Clara, the way a lion views another lion who enters his area. But Clara did not move. But I knew if I didn't do something, things would spiral out of control. I bolted from my position and dashed over to where they were standing, took Clara's hand and murmured, Honey, let us go. They said that mom was in the hospital, which was obviously a fabrication, before taking her to the counter where the cashier hastily scanned our belongings before departing, I apologized to the man and dragged a stunned Clara behind me. 
After we had left the mall, she appeared to snap out of shock and asked me who the hell I thought I was. I calmly explained that if I hadn't intervened when I did, the man would have done something to her, and I told her that we live in a country where the police cannot guarantee our safety. She seemed to relax after that and thanked me. We exchanged contact information before I escorted her to her car and watched her drive away before getting into mine. That single encounter altered my life forever. Clara and I started texting and going on innocent lunch and dinner dates before I asked her to be my girlfriend. She agreed, and it was heaven on earth. I'd always wake up to calls from her offering surprise visits, home-cooked meals, and additional dates, but we never became too intimate. Clara came from a Catholic family and they don't take too lightly to such things. Her parents are Yoruba and also quite traditional, so simple things like lying on the floor to greet them matter a lot. After dating for three years, I popped the question and she said yes. I was beyond happy because I had finally found my better half my missing rib. Cheesy. I know. The wedding was beautiful and finally it was time to go home and start the rest of our lives. We waited a year before we started trying for kids. The reason for this was because we both agreed that we wanted to have that period all to ourselves and build our careers before we can bring a child into the picture. On the second anniversary of our marriage, Clara surprised me with a positive pregnancy test result. And to say that I was happy was a big lie. I was more than happy. And why wouldn't I be? I was married to the perfect woman and she was about to give me the perfect child I always assumed were happy. I worked hard as an accountant and advised LLP CPA firm at 6230 Wilshire Boulevard, Suite 192, Los Angeles, California, 90,048. United States provide for our comfortable life at L.A. I trusted Clara completely and never suspected that anything was wrong. I mean, what could possibly go wrong? Now, five years and two kids later, I start noticing some changes. Clara stopped sending me good morning texts. Yes, yes, I know what you're thinking. But even after we got married, she still kept the habit of always sending me good morning texts whenever she woke up. She always got up before I did to take care of the kids and get breakfast ready but always found time to send me the cutest texts that would leave me smiling and giggling to myself all day. It was always something short and cute, like if you were a vegetable, you'd be a cucumber. Or are you Netflix? Because I could watch you for hours. But all of a sudden the messages stopped coming. When it first happened, I just brushed it off and assumed that she had a pretty hectic day and must have forgotten. But when two weeks had gone back without any good morning texts, I knew that Clara had changed. It was as though she had stopped caring about me and our marriage. The only time I would see her brighten up would be when she's with our kids. But whenever we would be alone, she would be so stiff and uptight with me that every conversation with her feel like a conversation between my boss and I. I thought I had done something wrong and even went as far as apologizing and treating her to a fancy dinner. But even after all that, she still remained the same. She had started keeping late nights, claiming she had to work overtime or meet with friends. She became so distant and cold that she started avoiding my affection and attention. I have never questioned my wife and her work. Neither have I ever imagined her doing anything to hurt me. So I always went with her excuses. We had to get made to help take care of the kids while we were at work. But I made sure to always coming back before they went to bed. I always assured them that their mother loved them because my eldest daughter kept asking why her mother was hardly at home and if they had done something to upset their mother. Hearing this from a four-year-old girl broke my heart, so I told her that her mother just had a lot of work to do and also reassured them that their mother loved them so much. Each time I tell Clara what the kids say, she promises to change, which she does, but only for a day or two. Now I'm a very calm and quiet guy, but for some reason I was slowly getting agitated by what was going on. But I never for once questioned my wife's faithfulness to me. I always blamed her work or something else for her behavior. I never stopped being a loving and devoted husband who secretly prayed that things go back to the way they were. If someone had told me what the following year would bring and how it would affect me, I would have cussed the person out. The following year started off different. Clara was back to normal and even better than before. She was always smiling and laughing each time I saw her. The good morning texts started coming again, and she even added some happy endings at the end of the day for me, and I couldn't believe how lucky I was. 
I was also happy to see her spend more time with the children, and she even started coming back from work early. It was truly amazing because at that moment, I felt like nothing could ever go wrong with life. One thing that she also started doing the year was going to the gym at night with her friends from work. She went every Sunday and would return to the house some minutes past eight, but she was always in a cheerful mood when she returned, so I didn't question the odd hours. It suddenly changed from every Sunday to Saturdays and Sundays. I didn't mind because her attitude didn't change towards the kids and I, so I turned a blind eye to it. After six months of going to night gym, there was no visible change in her body. She was still the same and even added a few pounds. Not that I am complaining about that, though. One day I jokingly told her that I would love to join her in her gym sessions, and she immediately tensed up and got all defensive. She said, and I quote, You don't need to go to the gym with me. It's mostly just ladies working out and talking about their husbands. Upon saying this, it dawned on me that she had never told me the name of her gym or where it was located. So I asked her. She looked at me for some time before she said she needed to use the restroom. My fellow Redditors, the next time I asked about the name and location of the gym, she came prepared with even pictures of herself outside and inside the gym. The gym was Hybrid Gym Lee. After that, I left it alone, but I was still curious as to why she reacted the way she did the first time. I questioned her about it. It was our wedding anniversary, and I had intended to surprise her. I wanted to pay someone to accompany me to the gym with a cake, a money bucket, and a money cake, as well as a six off any player that played her favorite song for her. I also contacted her sister to assist me prepare the surprise. Follow me to capture the gorgeous moment about 5 p.m. Everyone was prepared, so we headed to the gym in my car. Fortunately, there was no traffic that day, so we only drove for 30 minutes. When we arrived, everyone took their spot. My sister-in-law started recording with her phone. I was holding the money book. The saxophonist was playing Westlife's My Love, while those holding the money cakes were at the back. I could hardly wait to see her face. Upon entering the premises, we were greeted by a slew of astonished and surprised expressions, but none of which belonged to Clara. Thinking she could have gone to the restroom, I approached the receptionist and inquired if my wife had arrived. She inquired for my wife's name, but after checking her records, she told me that no one with that name had registered there. I was perplexed because my wife had been visiting there for months. Or did I get the name incorrectly? I ordered her sister to contact her and ask where she was, but I specifically instructed her not to alert my wife of my presence. She departed to make a phone call, and I returned to the car with the others. After five minutes, she returned with an odd expression. When I asked her what had happened, she said Clara had told her she was at the Freehand L.A., which was located at 416 W. at St. Los Angeles, California, 914 United States. I just figured it was a job issue. Perhaps her friends had housed her to celebrate her anniversary with her. I realize it's dumb, but I've always made excuses for her. I asked if she had received the room number from Clara, to which she nodded and we were gone. Now I'm going to be honest with you. Nothing, and I mean nothing, could have prepared me for what occurred over my entire life. I've never had the privilege of wishing that the earth would open up and swallow me, never to be spewed back out again. Thinking about that makes me physically nauseated and foolish. How could I not have seen the signs? Why was I constantly making excuses for her? Why didn't I simply confront her? No matter how frequently I ask myself these questions, I never get a response. If I'd done anything sooner... Perhaps it will not hurt as much as it does right now. Or perhaps I would have fled before it became too late. I would still be sane and joyful. But instead, I chose to be the loving clown who trusted the enemy to take the bullet for me when we arrived at the motel. I informed the receptionist of my plan to surprise Clara and even mentioned that we already knew the room number. She agreed not to phone Clara's room, so we climbed up again, just as we had previously. Phone recording, saxophone playing, money, cakes, and a money bouquet. Ready? I took a deep breath and knocked on the door. The door opened, and there stood my wife in a towel, her hair wet. She froze as soon as she spotted me, and just as I was going to say anything, a voice behind her spoke. If it's room service, ask for new sheets. We went carried away and screwed up this one, the voice said. I recognize that voice, but I cannot place it. Clara remained motionless without speaking to me or moving before I could respond. 
Someone stood behind her in nothing but shorts. When he saw me, his eyes widened and his mouth fell open. It turned out to be John. John was my stepbrother. The same father, but a different mother. But you wouldn't know because we did everything together. I told him the day Clara agreed to go on a date with me. I informed him the day she consented to be my wife. He was there. He was my best man at my wedding for crying out loud. I also protested to him about Clara's misbehavior, and he assured me she would change. He even had the audacity to say that he might be cheating on me with someone else. But I suppose he was someone else. I loved John so much that I was willing to give him a kidney and a lung if he asked. And I always assumed the feeling was mutual, but the joke is on me, he he. I just stood there, speechless. Clara's sister had recovered from her astonishment and urged others to follow her down to the car while I stood there. I stared at the floor for what seemed like an age before opening my mouth. How long they both remained quiet. How long has this gone on? I let out a shout. This prompted them both to flinch. They'd never seen or heard me raise my voice before, so the shouting took them by surprise. Clara opened her mouth, but nothing came out. John finally spoke up. A year after Amanda was born, I raised my head and glanced at them. What? I managed to mumble. Clara was going through some tough times. We met and had a few of drinks. We ended up spending the night together when one thing led to another. I wanted to quit, but I did. Before John could speak another word, he punched him in the face. Clara attempted to speak to me, but in a flash of wrath, I slapped her across the face. What do you want to tell me? You're sorry, or were you lonely? Or perhaps I was never present? No, tell me what reason you want to make for sleeping with my stepbrother for three years while you caused me hell at home for two years. Some months you'd come home with an attitude, refusing to spend time with the kids your kids despise and nagged at everything I did. But what should I do? I continue to love you. I make allowances for you and your children. I excuse you to myself. I have even complained to them. I point to John, who is gripping his jaw. But what am I getting, as I mentioned? I could feel tears streaming down my cheeks, but I couldn't bring myself to wipe them away before either of them said anything else. I returned to the car, dropped off my sister-in-law and others who drove home, packed my belongings and my children's clothes, and drove them to my godmother. I simply told her to look after them, and that I would return to pick them up in a few days, but I have no account. Should she give Claire permission? Clara, please take them. I promised her I'd explain everything when I had the chance. After dropping them off, I returned to my house, took the gun I had secretly purchased as a bachelor, and checked into a tiny hotel. This concludes my narrative thus far. Clara has called and texted me several times, but I have not mentioned the critical phrase. I haven't moved from my bed in three days since the incident. I've not eaten or drunk anything. Neither have I stood up to take a shower. My mind is still foggy on everything. Most of the time, I wonder if America is genuinely my son. What if John caused the pregnancy? When these thoughts arise, I dismiss them by stating that I was present. When America came into this world, I saw and loved him like a son. Update. I've often wondered how someone could sleep comfortably after committing something so horrible that just thinking about it gives me goosebumps. I'm still at the motel after three months, and a lot has transpired since then. It's been a difficult road, and I honestly don't know how I feel about it all. For those of you who are confused, or if this is your first time hearing my tale, Hello, my name is Greg, and I'm in the midst of a chaotic circumstance. Now, to provide perspective, I outlined what I was going through in my prior piece, but I'll do a fast refresher. I had been married to the love of my life for six years, but I recently discovered that she had been cheating on me for three years, and you will not guess who she decided to sleep with, stepbrother of mine. I know it sounds hard to believe, and after all this time, I still find it difficult to comprehend that I was able to find myself in this predicament. And this is the type of crap you read about in the news or watch on YouTube. However, I am currently experiencing it in real life. My wife had been attempting to contact me and my children, but when she discovered that she couldn't, she attempted a different method. I am thinking about it now. I suddenly realized she's not the same woman I dated and fell in love with. Was she just disguising her actual colors, or were they always visible, and I was simply too foolish to see them? Anyway, back to what she did to leave a mark on my heart. 
My father called me one day and asked me to come over. Now, my father is Nigerian and grew up there before moving to the United States. And well, let's just say that my brothers and I were raised Nigerian style, and any time we were summoned, it always meant one of us had done something wrong and would be scolded once I received the call. I sat on the bed, trying to figure out what had prompted my father to summon me. I couldn't come up with anything, despite my best efforts. So I just accepted that I'd have to pay him a visit to find out. The next morning, I got up early to prepare for my appointment with my father. He had experienced it, so it took me some time to catch up. But when I did, I remembered why I had rarely visited. Everyone smiled and embraced me warmly, except for my father, who stood still. I approached him with my hand extended, expecting a handshake, but I did not receive one. When I got close enough to him, he drew him in, hugged me, let go of me, and smacked me across the face. Yes, I realize it seems crazy, but everything happened so quickly that I couldn't process it. Why are you so disappointing? It's hard enough that you didn't turn out like your siblings, but now you're cheating on your wife. I was stunned. I was unable to react. I stood there, hand on my cheek, staring at my father, who had a look on his face. I have never seen this before. He gave me a slap. My father never raised his hands to strike us. So where was this coming from? What I managed to say after a few seconds. He repeated his comments, but this time with calmness. After saying that, he sat down and looked at me, waiting for my reaction. Who stated I had cheated on her? I inquired, still looking at my father and resting my hand on my cheek. My father took a big breath and examined me from head to toe before speaking. Listen, marriage has its ups and downs, and even though you had never done things correctly, I never anticipated you to be the one accused of cheating on his partner, he added, staring me dead in the eyes. I eventually let go of my cheek and attempted to defend myself. When I tried to mumble anything, he asked me to leave. Yes, he requested me to leave and add a cherry on top of the frosting. He told me that I had to call my wife, apologize to her, and beg her to accept me back, or my family will disown me. I would be disowned by my family. My father would disown me for something I did not do. As soon as I arrived at my motel, I collapsed on my bed and began giggling. I burst out laughing. My stomach started to hurt, and before I knew it, I had fallen asleep. The next day, I decided to go visit my kids at my mother's house. When I arrived, they were overjoyed to see me and, as usual, wanted to know when their mother would return from her trip. I had told them she had gone on a business trip, and since I had moved my children from their previous school, I didn't have to worry about Clara looking for them there. My parents had divorced and were living separately. They split up two years after Clara and I were married, but I never told Clara where she resides, and I am grateful for it right now. After spending time with my children, I met with my mother and explained what had happened between her husband and me. She was startled that I was not given a listening ear and was intimidated in this manner. Mom was aware of everything that had occurred between Claire and I, so she was able to assess the issue fairly. She asked me to file for divorce and fight for custody of my child, but I warned her that doing so would result in my father getting involved. And because he believes I am to blame, he would hire the greatest lawyer money can buy and take my children away from me. I stayed until 7 p.m. before I returned to the motel. When I arrived, an idea occurred to me, so I called my sister-in-law to discuss it. We'd been in touch all along, and she even informed me that Clara had brought John home and made up a fiction to their parents to win them over. She also mentioned that Clara was different, but I informed her that I had not called her to discuss her sister and that I needed something from her. I told her what I needed, and she agreed. The next day, I had the courage to go to my residence. Clara, when I arrived, everything appeared to be the same, but it felt different. I knocked on the door, which Clara opened. She was taken aback when she saw me, but she quickly recovered and invited me in. I sat down, and she offered me a drink, but I rejected. After what felt like hours, I cleared my throat and spoke. How are you, Clara? When I said her name and looked at her, tears welled up in my eyes. However, I had to bite my tongue to keep from crying. I'm fine. How are you? You seem pallid. Have you been eating properly? She inquired, her tone indicating concern. I didn't answer right away because what was I supposed to say? I was okay. Of course not, but I was not going to let her see it. I'm okay, Clara. I've just been swamped with work. Look, I came back because I stopped talking, looked her in the eyes, and went to my knees. 
please excuse me. I apologize for anything that occurred. I apologize for not being a better husband, for not paying attention, for not loving you more, and for failing as a husband. Please forgive me, Clara. I was in tears by this point. I was sobbing like a child while Clara sat there helplessly staring at me. After a few moments, she stood up and kneeled beside me. She wiped away my tears and told me that she had forgiven me and that everything was great as long as I recognized my error. I realized it and requested her to let me back into her life. I also informed her I had given them my blessings to be together, and she was overjoyed. She started doing a little dance that always made me happy. I chose to come back in with her, but only as a housemaid, until I can get my own place. I also learned that John and Clara were planning a wedding. John and I patched things up the next week, and everything was going so wonderfully. I returned the kids, and they were overjoyed to see their mother. Now I'm sure you're going to ask me what's happened to me, or call me the biggest simp ever. But I don't really care. I was delighted to see Clara smiling. That was all that mattered. Everything was going nicely at home. Clara and John would go out, and I would stay at home to care for the children. John and I rapidly reconnected, and I even became his best man. I can vividly recall feeling like a girl who had been asked to dance. He informed me about it. I assisted with most of the planning and ensured that everything went smoothly. Clara's parents have forgiven me for what I did to their daughter, but her sister refuses to speak to me. She thinks I'm crazy. What exactly does she know? Love drives you to do stupid things, and truthfully, I wasn't complaining. My father was satisfied with my decision and even invited me to visit him whenever I wanted. The wedding took place at the Hollywood in Suits Hotel in El Segundo, Bobby Gardena, and we'd hold a big reception in their lovely hall. Clara and John delegated all responsibility to me, and to be honest, I felt so peaceful after doing all of this for them. I found myself questioning why I hadn't done this earlier. I even discovered that Clara was expecting... I mean, she informed me first and made me pledge not to tell John. I was quite happy. She trusted me enough to tell me about it. Clara looked frightened one day, so I asked her what was up. It's nothing serious, just pre-wedding nerves, I suppose, she explained while glancing at her nails. I took her hands in mine, kissed them softly, and told her she didn't have to worry. I had planned everything down to the last detail, and all they needed to do was show there and be delighted. She smiled hugged me tightly, and thanked me as she pulled away. We both recognized how close our faces were to each other, without any warning. She kissed me, and I kind of kissed back. Before you despise me, realize that I still loved her, and I suppose those feelings never left. She did not draw away from the kiss. She simply smiled and replied, Thank you. I smiled back and left the room. I was quite happy. I almost jumped up like a child. I had to go to bed early because the wedding was tomorrow. Life is not always beautiful, but when you have something to look forward to every day, you stop noticing the thorns and instead concentrate on the roses. I had become so fixated on the thorns that I had forgotten how the roses smelled, but not anymore. I planned to give life another opportunity, but first, I needed to be present for two crucial people in my life right now. Finally, the wedding day had arrived and Clara looked breathtaking in her bridal gown. She donned a trumpet wedding gown with a long veil and a crown on her head, while John wore a three-piece slim-fit suit with Oxford shoes. They both looked like something out of a novel. I am not kidding you. I was in tears as they both said their vows. The wedding ceremony was lovely, and it was time for the celebration. After everyone had eaten and had a good time, I asked John if I might have some time to give them a gift, and he agreed. I just enjoy happy endings. They always made me grin, so I wanted to give them one. I had constructed a large screen and hired a projector because I intended to show them a slideshow. The slideshow began with a photo of Clara as a baby, followed by one of John as a child, which inspired the audience to smile and move. All that followed were recordings of Clara and John, as well as adorable moments where they looked at each other, smiled and laughed. It was a great moment. Then a video played. I was smiling at the camera. I cannot wait to see her face when we get there. It is intended to be priceless. I know things have been difficult and work has been crazy, but I continue to love you. I'll always love you. I addressed the camera before asking the person in front of me if they were ready. The following slide showed a video of me in the gym with Kenzie looking around for Clara. 
Then it showed the gym receptionist who informed us that Clara was not a member. Then I pointed the camera at myself and talked. Did I forget the name of the gym? I was still asking myself questions when Clara's sister called and said she had gotten her sister on the phone. So I glanced into the camera, smiled, and said, Let us go. When you may guess, the bride appears to be uncomfortable in her seat when the groom shoots me. Death glares, but I simply grin back and return my gaze to the video. We had arrived at the hotel and noticed the receptionist talking to me. Then we slowly ascended the hotel steps. We approached the door and the saxophone could be heard in the background. As I was going to knock on the door, John got up and ordered that the slide presentation be halted. To everyone's amazement, my father told him to be quiet and requested me to continue. Now that I've told you I had the largest smile on my face, I'll continue with the slideshow and show you how I learned about Clara and John. The entire room went silent. Everyone looked at the newlywed and shook their heads. I wasn't done, my fellow Redditors. You know, I recorded our entire chat that day, which was shown. The next slideshow was about Clara. She was observed with an older man, and they appeared to be intimate. I waited for a bit, then grabbed the microphone. Ladies and gentlemen, how are we doing? How are we doing at the wedding? So, good. Okay, some of you may know me as the wicked ex-husband who cheated on his lovely wife, and many of you despised me without even knowing me. I was even threatened by my own father because of her. I had often wondered why. But guess what? Now I know. After then, I started the video. And guess what? My father was the older man shown in the video. Yes, it's my biological father. I learned about them after making peace with Clara and John. But let's return to the wedding, the moment my father's image showed on the screen. I believe I heard someone scream, but at the time, I didn't even want to turn back. I was too focused on how well the video turned out. The following slide showed a photo, or rather a series of pictures, of Clara and my father, with an audio recording playing in the background. Claire was on the phone with a friend, telling her how she had gotten pregnant again for my father. She also confessed that my father was our daughter's biological father and that she was going to repeat the process with John, telling him that he was the father. I appeared in the final clip. Clara and I kissed it that night. We may have done more than that. Every single second was recorded. However, before it concluded, a video showing John hitting on Clara's younger sister appeared. He claimed that he was just marrying her so that he could purchase life insurance for her. He also stated that once he was finished with her, Clara, he would come for her sister. A small notice appeared when the clip concluded. John and Clara, best wishes on your married life. I hope you find what you've been looking for in each other. And I hope you enjoy this wedding gift of mine. After the screen went blank, I said goodbye to everyone and departed the hall. I changed my phone number, gathered my children and fled. I recall saying that I couldn't understand how individuals could sleep comfortably after spreading havoc. I still can't since I have been sleeping like a baby since that day. I still have my children with me and I'm currently with Kenzie Clare, his sister. We are not yet united. Who knows? Something may happen later, that is all. Here's the next story. I'm 32 years old and female. My spouse, a 33-year-old guy, and I have been married for five years. My husband's office recently hired a new employee approximately a year ago. Let us call her Jessica. Female is 25 years old. My spouse would frequently grumble about how ignorant she was. Here are some of the list's complaints. She always tries to appear intelligent, and even though she is a child, she always laughs. He finds it annoying when people do dumb things. He sometimes questioned her freewheeling demeanor. He once told me that she was dressed as a clown. She only wanted red lipstick. It appears that every time he returns from work, he complains about her or what she did, and most of the time it's simply normal garbage, he explained. Just mocks him by referring to him as an elderly guy. That irritates him terribly. This girl, Jess, seems to be on his mind all the time. We went shopping the other day. I loved a red sneaker and asked my spouse how I looked. He remarked it would look lovely on me. Then, unexpectedly, he replied, Thank God you don't have stinky feet like Jess. You're usually wearing shoes that look odd on her. And then he went on to describe how much he despises her and considers her his foe. This certainly came out of nowhere. He follows Jess on Instagram, which confirms my suspicion. We sat on her couch. I was watching a movie as he scrolled through Instagram. He was on Jess's Facebook, literally binging on her content. I mean, 
If he dislikes her and everything she does, why is he stalking her? I brought it up and he said I was being silly and that I should know he despises Jess. So assuming that there is something going on makes me appear insecure. I don't know what to trust. My instinct suggests something else. If he truly despised someone, he would not bring them up in every conversation. Where should they go next? Opie, it appears you're onto something here. I mean, she is definitely taking up some rent-free room in his mind. And it makes sense that the only reason he talks about her so frequently is because she is on his mind for some reason or another. And he's either in denial or attempting to make himself despise her. Either that or he's putting on a show for you. Don't anticipate it. However, some cheaters are unable to control themselves and their large mouths come in the way of their own falsehoods. It's as if his mouth is attempting to compensate for his cheating behavior. Update. I've got an answer. They're involved in an emotional affair. I found out everything when I examined my husband's phone. Don't tell me about privacy. I questioned him hard on it, and he said he has feelings for her. He had taken the day off from work so they could go trekking or simply hang around. He insists he did not sleep with the orchestra. I'm not certain about it. Their conversations appear to be more banter-based. I asked him whether he likes her. He was initially hesitant, but eventually admitted to having a crush on her. I inquired, why? Why are you crushing on her when she isn't someone he likes? His reasoning. She energizes me. She gets me to do insane stuff. And she exudes an energy that makes me feel unique. I am really hopeless. For months, I've been asking him to take a break so that we can travel to Italy like we've always desired. He kept making excuses. I wanted to tell him he's chasing a fantasy. He likes the version of oneself she portrays. But who am I to persuade a lovesick man to cheat on his five-year-old wife simply because she lacks energy? I left my home. I'm staying with a friend. I have not made a decision on divorce yet. I'm afraid to start over. I want to become a mother. But it means I'd waste my valuable years looking for another man. I can't believe he's falling for the obvious manic pixie dream girl stereotype. If he genuinely wanted to have energy and do wild things, why wouldn't he just say it? I would love to go hiking. I'd love to skip work and spend all day outside with him. Nonetheless, he chose a female he swears he despises, but not truly. He's called and texted me incessantly. He wants to work things out and has offered to quit and change jobs. But that's not going to solve anything, right? I am sorry, Opie. The dude has obviously lost it. She's too young and stupid, and now she's giving him energy. He has no idea what he is doing. If you've already tried to resolve the situation by stating, hey, let's go to Italy like we've always wanted, and he's made excuse after excuse not to, but he's eager to be spontaneous and spend the day off work with this woman, he doesn't really know. It sort of reveals his priorities. This is very heartbreaking. I have feelings for Europe. If he quits his job and you both try to work things out, there's nothing to say he won't stop talking to her. However, you must consider whether you truly want to work things out with a man who is ready to do this to you and your children. I'm not sure how to start this update. For those of you who do not know. Yes, I intend to file for divorce. I don't think I can reconcile with him after what he's admitted to. My husband asked to speak with me the day after I wrote my last piece. He stated that he is willing to be honest, since he does not want this to ruin our marriage. He's open to trying therapy and counseling. He admitted that he had a crush on her and frequently fantasizes about Jess, but these are only fantasies. He admitted that, while there was no physical touch or contact, he did have a moment of weakness and masturbated in front of each other. He insists he did not touch her. They simply jerked off in front of each other in his vehicle. It was entirely his idea. She knew about his crush, but she has values. So they discovered an unusual loophole. I wish I was joking, because this sounds unbelievable to me. He still claims that was the only sexual act they conducted. Nothing more. He's been imploring me to come home. He switches from begging to blaming me. And when I told him I wanted a divorce, he cursed me. I have served him. I have yet to hear from him or his attorney. I know some people will say I'm making a big mistake in dismissing this too quickly, but I don't think I'll be able to trust him again. What is the point of a relationship if trust is absent? I was surprised that my parents supported me. My mother told me that I should not have to beg someone to love or respect me. He lied to me, which was a huge disrespect, as a relationship cannot survive without respect. Also, I believe my previous post offended many people because they misinterpreted it to mean women over the age of 30. I don't believe that. 
However, I grew up in a culture that considers women over the age of 30 to be a burden. Then my parents and family members don't believe that there are people around me who do, and it has become ingrained. I tried hard to unlearn it, but there are still some traces. I don't know what the future holds for me. I'm too depressed and angry to consider that. Yes, I am currently in therapy. I've been in and out of therapy since the age of 25. Please don't believe his lies. They went a lot further in a car. Obviously, it wasn't just a fantasy. And your mother's correct. You shouldn't have to beg for someone to love or respect you. The type of stuff should come with unwavering loyalty. Update is keeping the marriage alive. Only responsibility for one person. My husband cheated on me with his co-worker. I'm divorcing him, yet the blame is on me. It is my fault that he cheated because he was bored of our marriage. Somehow it is my responsibility to keep my marriage. My parents are supportive, but the majority of my relatives and friends are not to them. His cheating was not cheating because there was no sex. Technically, especially when my brother is berating me for leaving my marriage, he thinks I'm giving up on my marriage way too easily. Then I should grow up and fix it rather than breaking it. But I have my doubts. Why is it my burden to fix it? I didn't break it. I was a loyal wife to him. I never strayed. Isn't marriage supposed to be about mutual input? I see a lot of women and men cave into the narrative that they are breaking up the family by divorcing their cheating spouses. I'm just frustrated about this push that I'm getting from my own brother. Why should I forgive him? Am I not allowed to be bitter? Am I not allowed to be angry? The only person who gave up on the marriage was your ex who decided to chase after the kid he claimed to hate. You don't owe that man anything, and you certainly don't owe anyone an explanation as to why you want to divorce him. Update work wife or wife. I will not bore you guys with the details. You can check my profile for it. My husband and I are getting a divorce. He has not stopped convincing me to stay. But the shamelessness of his activities is sending me to the moon. We are legally still married. From what I have heard, he is dating his work wife, a.k.a. the girl he pretended to hate. He was never someone who posts a lot on Instagram or Facebook, but he's been flooding his feed with her pictures. I know he is doing this to piss me off, and I am an idiot to stalk his new girlfriend. She has pictures of him all over his feet, and every caption, he is work husband. Yes, I get that she is immature. I know I shouldn't care, but I do. I wish I was strong enough to not give an F, but I do. I struggle with being confident and doing the gray rock technique, but it is hard, regardless of what he did or how much he humiliated me. I still loved him. I still had dreams about us and our about our future. I am afraid to start from zero and picking up the pieces of my broken trust while he is having wild sex with his work wife. I keep telling myself it is not real. He's just falling for the manic pixie dream girl. But it hurts to know he will choose her rather than me. Well, I made that choice. It was my choice to divorce him. It was my choice to move out. I wanted to be a mother and have a husband that loves me. But I am starting from zero and running out of time. If I was desperate, I would have forgave him, but I cannot. My heart does not allow me to. Why is your work wife more important than your wife? Why did I have to compete for your attention when she was getting it for free? I do not want to be jealous, but I am. I wish I could reconcile. But knowing me and what I have learned, it is not meant for me. I hate living a contradictory life when I do not care about him. But I still care enough that it hurts. He easily replaced me. I'm so sorry, Opie. It absolutely is hard, but I feel as though it would be much harder to try to stay with someone like your ex, and you shouldn't have to compete for someone's attention like that. You're doing the best thing for you. Now it's your time. Update guilt and moving on with life. I'm separated from my husband because he had an emotional affair. I think the affair was physical too, but he still doesn't want to admit it. But I do not want to be in his drama anymore. The evidence of his emotional affair was enough. It's been two months since we were separated. He's already started dating his affair partner. Right now, I'm dealing with depression and anxiety. I have started therapy as well, but deep down, I feel so down. Like during the holidays, we used to spend time together, locked inside. I never thought I would spend it alone now, but I think I left up. I'm currently with my parents. They always host these big Christmas dinners. I met a guy who is the son of my father's friend. He is divorced and has a kid. He and I hooked up. I guess I was just lonely. I'm never someone who has random hookups, but I feel this immense guilt in me like I am the one who is cheating on my husband. I do not feel well. 
Not because the sex was horrible, but because I am still a married lady. I still feel close to my soon-to-be ex, even though he has already moved on with his manic pixie dream lady. Did any of you who started dating after separation feel guilty about being with other people? Is a natural thing to feel guilty because you still have love for the man who you thought you were married to? My soon-to-be ex-wife and his affair partner are now in an open relationship. Two days ago, my soon-to-be ex called me and I was bewildered. What does he want now? In a few months, our divorce will be finalized. He has moved on with his affair partner. He called me to ask me how I am. It was small chit conversation. He then asked me if we can hang out now. It was 9 p.m. at night. I definitely declined. The next day, I got to know via a buddy that his affair partner posted on social media about being in an open relationship. Her post basically praised my ex and how he was understanding of her not being monogamous. She identifies as Polly, and they are in an open relationship. This whole thing made me feel strange, like, who the F did I marry? What the F is he doing? He used to be monogamous like me. For her, he is now willing to have an open relationship. I know I shouldn't be concerned about their lives, but it's weird. You cheated me, make my life miserable, your romantic or affair partner, and now you have a non-monogamous relationship. I don't believe I knew him well. I'm seriously questioning my ability to judge others. Was he always like this? To be honest, everyone here knows it won't last for them. He's attempting to be someone he's not, and it's going to catch up with him quickly. Thank you for taking the time to hear today's story. If you enjoyed this article, please like and subscribe if you haven't already. If you have a story to tell about your or someone else's situation, please do not hesitate to contact me. Please take care.